communication and physical contact with other beings has been ongoing for years, according to many people affected by the UFO abduction syndrome. But the official social and political attitude into the 21st century has been that we humans are alone in this huge universe. NASA's search for extraterrestrial intelligence known as SETI that listened for certain frequencies in the cosmos had been the only respectable public focus for questions about extraterrestrial life until Congress canceled funding in the fall of 1993. Then SETI continued on to this day in another program that still searches. Ironically, other intelligences have been coming and going here on Earth with or without SETI's knowledge, according to government whistleblowers and to people in the human abduction syndrome. Part of the alien agenda is described by government whistleblowers as the harvesting of genetic material to create hybrids and clones. If that's true, that would explain the various descriptions of alien beings in the abduction syndrome. Are there a variety of biological species from somewhere else in the universe coming and going on our planet? Abductees say there are also different dimensional realities that are occupied by other intelligences. And government whistleblowers talk about an alien presence on Earth that has been coexisting with surface life from extensive underground bases all over this planet. Even human abductees are not certain about the true nature of the alien intelligences involved in their lives. But after my own three decades of interviews and having seen hundreds of drawings of other beings by abductees, various types of beings break down into a few repeating categories. On this Truth Hunter, I would like to share an emerging taxonomy of alien presences that seem to be interacting with Earth today and have allegedly interacted in the past, perhaps as long as 270 million years ago, according to one US government whistleblower. Taxonomy is the science of naming, describing, and classifying organisms. The taxonomy I'm going to talk about today is not familiar to the majority of people on this planet yet. But I think the truth hunter audiences are people who do not believe humans are alone in this vast universe, no matter what policies of denial governments have used to keep the public and the media ignorant on purpose. Why have there been decades of secrecy about such a fundamentally important fact that we humans are not alone in this universe? I think at least one reason is that during World War II, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, American General Dwight Eisenhower, and U.S. President Harry S. Truman, they were afraid of public panic if they told the truth about what they were learning and called celestial craft and beings. This letter is an excerpt to the UK's Ministry of Defense in London dated October 4th, 1999. It was about a British scientist's father who worked as a security guard for Prime Minister Winston Churchill. The son reported to the MOD that his father overheard Churchill tell then General Eisenhower about a silver metallic disc that shocked an RAF pilot with its aerial maneuvers. The silver disc was described as rapidly flying in loops around and around the length of the RAF jet fighter itself, moving fast in the sky. Prime Minister Churchill was heard to say to General Eisenhower that, quote, the incident should be immediately classified for at least 50 years, close quote. That was around 1944. Today, we appear to be close to the huge paradigm shift, that the universe has lots of intelligent life. I say that because as a TV producer and investigative reporter, I have been trying to leverage open truths about non-human interactions with Earth humans and animals since I produced a TV documentary entitled A Strange Harvest. That was about the worldwide bloodless, trackless mutilations of large and small animals that was first broadcast on May 25, 1980 
on the then CBS affiliate KMGH-TV Channel 7 in Denver, Colorado. And it was awarded a regional Emmy. Channel 7 is where I was director of special projects. My TV producer, writer, director, editor career had begun a decade before after graduating in 1968 from Stanford University in Palo Alto, California with a master's degree in communication. At Stanford University in Palo Alto, I made a documentary film for the Stanford Medical Center and my master's thesis was a picture calculus about the first efforts to use computers to analyze atomic particle bombardment images at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. After that, I produced science and medical programs for the ABC affiliate in Boston at WCVB. There, I was an honored producer in the station's Peabody Award for Broadcasting Excellence. My journalism beat has always been science, environment, and medicine. And it was in that context that I began investigating all the cattle, horses, and other animal mutilations in Colorado, the surrounding region, and the world. That's when I was first told by sheriffs and ranchers that the perpetrators were creatures from outer space. I have been trying ever since to understand who and how have non-humans been harvesting Earth life and why. In this Truth Hunter, I am going to present illustrations and information from human abductees, government and military whistleblowers, and alleged government documents. Even if we do not have the official announcement yet that confirms the alien presences and their very complex agendas. In 1994, my second book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1, Facts and Eyewitnesses, was published with a 50-page taxonomy of non-human entities and updated in a 2015 new edition. The taxonomy that I compiled from dozens of color and black and white illustrations shared with me by people in the human abduction syndrome I grouped together different types of alien beings by shape and color, but with little understanding about the relationship of the beings to each other. Here are some images from that taxonomy. Houston, Texas, May 1973. Then teenager Cindy Tyndall and her mother Judy Doherty were abducted near a pasture outside Houston, where a calf was being lifted up in a pale yellow beam that soon took the mother and daughter too. On board, they watch snake-eyed gray creatures, an insect entity, and another being with large black eyes who seemed more gentle and kind. The non-human entities all worked in a lab excising tissues from the beamed-up calf. The non-humans also examined Cindy and Judy, including swabbing tissue from inside Cindy's mouth, apparently collecting DNA. Cindy also sketched this mushroom-headed being with vertical pupils. This non-human also worked with tubes in a round laboratory room during the abduction with her mother and the calf from the Houston pasture. Memphis, Tennessee, 1980s. Adult male encountered this tall red-haired being during an abduction. Similar red-haired types have been described by abductees in Nevada, Southern California, and the Andes Mountains of Peru. New Jersey, 1987. Adult female worked with a sketch artist to depict the male on the left, about seven feet tall, that was working with the blonde female humanoid. The blonde female humanoid had a, quote, pearlescent, translucent complexion, close quote. The New Jersey female abductee thought that the male's eyes were more golden and the female's a pale crystal blue. But the abductee compared both of their eyes to a cat's in which there are vertical dark pupils and no white showing. The female abductee stressed that when she first saw the tall male humanoid, his eyes were solid black, quote, he took something off like shields, and there were cat eyes underneath." Close quote. In the lower right corner are two overlapping triangles that the New Jersey abductees said 
the tall beings wore on their leotard jumpsuits, which signified, quote, the merging of two worlds, close quote. She did not know which worlds or why. That same New Jersey female also sketched this tall, beak-nosed humanoid male that worked with a cat-eyed, tall blonde, and dark-haired beings during an abduction experience in 1987. That's when she and her family and two cars were all lifted from the Pennsylvania Turnpike to a large aerial craft. Here's another blonde type encountered in Springfield, Missouri in March 1982. The adult female was abducted by six foot tall, blonde haired male humanoids in brown jumpsuits that had a winged insignia on the upper left chest. Other abductees have described snakes with wings in the insignias of some blonde beings. Southern California, 1990, adult female drew these three non-humans after an abduction experience. She said the non-humans had light brownish yellow skin. The being on the right also had a triangle inside a circle on his upper right chest. That symbol has been seen by many abductees, including Jean Robinson of Springfield, Missouri. She drew this circle around an equilateral triangle that she remembered on the left breast of her abductor's bodysuit. What is the significance of the triangle and the circle symbol seen in so many encounters with the various gray-skinned and light brown or yellowish brown types of beings? Why are there different sizes, skin colors, head shapes, and eyes among the gray-skinned entities? Why are there different looking blonde types some tall, some shorter. Why do some tall blonde types wear insignias of overlapping triangles in a circle, while shorter blondes have a bird or snake inside a round insignia on their uniforms? Why do some humans report seeing standing up lizards, while others say it looked like a standing up cro crocodile with scales all over the body? Always confusing to me has been the question, what are the relationships between various entities? Let's look at a few more illustrations from my original taxonomy so that I can show why I think the menagerie of so many different kinds over the decades and centuries probably are the product of only two or three prime intelligences. I define a prime intelligence as one of the top dogs behind the scenes that produces cloned and hybridized life forms for a wide range of work assignments. Essentially, the clones and hybrids would be androids, organic art artificial intelligence, or more simply, smart robots. Mount Vernon, Missouri, 1990. Pale gray entity with large slanted black eyes with a triangle on its blue uniform surrounding what looks like a crescent moon emitting energy. This was drawn by Paula Watson, who had repeated abductions from 1983 onward after she and her husband, Ron, watched small gray-skinned non-humans float a black cow from a nearby pasture into a strange craft that was guarded by what they called a lizard guy. His hands had only four fingers. Central Georgia, 1950s, adult male painted this daytime encounter at his Central Georgia farm. He told me, quote, these little guys seem to float down out of the sky. They seem to be able to appear and disappear, close quote. New Jersey, 1987. Adult male painted these small beings he saw in his house during a time of numerous close encounter experiences from age eight onward. Quote, they've used me like a sperm bank, close quote. He had abductions since his early 20s in which sperm was collected by the non-humans. New Jersey, 1987, adult male painted these small beings that he saw in his house during a time of numerous close encounter experiences from age eight onward. Quote, they've used me like a sperm bank, sounding like the other man, close quote. He had abductions since his early 20s in which sperm was collected by the non-humans. Longmont, Colorado, November 1980. Tall, white-skinned, bald-headed humanoid wearing a long blue cape with a high blue collar was sketched by an adult male under hypnosis 
under a joint abduction with his wife in late November 1980. Likely the 1987 New Jersey family members in two cars somehow were taken by an extraterrestrial craft using invisibility technology from the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And the Colorado husband and wife were also picked up in their car from along Mont Highway. The husband, a commercial artist, also sketched another smaller beam. The husband said this entity's skin was actually the color of the gray sketch paper. But under hypnosis, he figured that he picked out the contrasting flesh color to sketch with. The husband was confused by the layered yellow gold collar, a detail that seemed so out of place on what he said was an extraterrestrial. Why would it need a layered collar? But other people over the past several decades have also seen and sketched robes and collars on some of their ET handlers. The Longmont husband also sketched with charcoal, a wider scene of this yellow collared entity that shows arched windows around the craft's perimeter, which are drawn by other abductees in other cases. And under hypnosis, the husband called the being, quote, the creep because it examined me and took my mind out and added something. There's more to life, more to the world. There's more to everything than anybody knows. There are more than three dimensions everywhere. It all works together. Everything coexists. There are different dimensions we cannot go into, close quote. Jenkintown, Pennsylvania, 1992. Adult male with several abduction experiences sketched another collared being that he encountered, and he said, quote, it had a flattened nose with odd ridges and eyes like a cat's. I've seen a machine hooked up to me to collect sperm. Bakersfield, California, 1990. Adult female sketched yet another purple cape with a high collar on a being that she thought was at least seven feet tall. He had a larger cranium than most human heads, along with a very big and long nose. His large slanted eyes had huge vertical black pupils surrounded by gold irises. She said, quote, he was in charge of everything over everyone else, close quote, including the small gray being. She had the distinct impression that the tall being genetically made the small gray robots to do work for the taller beings, and the taller beings then would be the prime intelligence. A side note about big curved noses from the famous case of Betty and Barney Hill's abduction in the White Mountains of New Hampshire on September 19th to 20th, 1961. Afterward, Betty had dreams and she wrote them down, and they were included in the appendix of the 1966 John Fuller book, The Interrupted Journey. Betty Hill wrote, quote, their alien noses were larger and longer than the average size human nose. Although I have seen people with noses like the ones on the ETs, Betty said, like Jimmy Durante, close quote, Durante was the famous 20th century singer, nicknamed the Schnoz for his large beak nose. Jacksonville, Florida, 1964. Another prominent cranium was sketched by an adult male encountered in an abduction at age four. He said the being, quote, was about five feet tall, no ears, small mouth, tight fitting clothes. Color of jumpsuit was royal blue with magenta colors and very long fingers, close quote. New Hope, Pennsylvania, September 1985. New York City adult male drew this being and craft at night after an encounter in New Hope. Quote, female entity, about five and a half feet tall, very thin, with pure white skin, was standing about 30 yards away. He said that he drew it with yellow because of the reflection at night. Her body seemed to glow in a translucent colored light consisting of blues and reds. Her eyes transfixed me and I felt as though my mind was being looked through. I was under the absolute control of this entity. 
who was accompanied by these little three creatures in blue coat uniforms with what looked like odd black netting over their faces, close quote. Missouri, October 1976. Adult male sketched this non-human after he was abducted with his wife and their one-year-old daughter. Quote, I had no control over my thoughts. The being took everything from my mind, but I knew nothing about him, close quote. Central Georgia, 1950s. Praying mantis encountered in full daylight consciousness at noontime by the young male at his family's Georgia farm when he was only eight years old. He associated the praying mantis with small gray beings, which he thought at the time were something like androids programmed to do work for the praying mantis types. The same eight-year-old also saw a little gray entity behind two glowing-faced praying mantis creatures at the Central Georgia farm in the 1950s. Covina, California, 1963. 17-year-old female teenage abductee taken by a large praying mantis to a room that was filled with sparkly yellow-white light. Quote, I remember the praying mantis entity slowly coming around the corner and facing me. He stood very still and simply waited as if he knew how frightening he appeared to me. Eventually, he began to talk to me in my mind telepathically. He seemed to possess a great deal of dignity and he gave the impression of being quite old. He walked me to this room that was filled with dense light. The memory ends with me about to enter that room and the thought in my head translated into the light has to do with what happened, close quote. The experience involved a soul transfer, she thought, from her human body under the supervision of a gray being who apparently worked with or for this praying mantis. The California teenager received a telepathic explanation from the praying mantis and the gray being that it was vital that her soul spirit entity continue earth life in the same container body in which he was born in 1946. Cloning her was necessary, the being said, because her heart had been damaged by rheumatoid fever. So a new healthier clone version of her had been created in which she would continue her earth life. She was left with the impression that soul recycling in specific body containers was very important to the praying mantis and the gray beings. Springfield, Missouri, 1980s. Female abductee Jean Robinson encountered a six foot tall, green, scaly skinned humanoid with large yellow irises that surrounded black vertical pupils Jean described the chest as looking like large bones protruded from under the scaly reptilian skin and gave the impression of body armor. Springfield, Missouri, 1991, another adult female from Missouri was in bed sleeping when she began floating out of her bedroom toward a light and through the wall. She saw a, quote, repulsive looking entity with thin arms and an ugly face like a giant grasshopper, close quote. But instead of a grasshopper, she worked with a sketch artist to draw a humanoid entity with net-like scales all over its body. The sketch artist, Lisa Duesenberry, attached these notes to her illustration when she sent them to me. Quote, the female abductee felt the sensation of being pulled by a force with fast movement to a reptilian humanoid about five feet, nine inches. It had a green body that looked scaly and rough. She felt electricity going through her hands. The reptoid had pea green eyes with yellow and black vertical pupils she said were like a cat. Eyes slanted down toward the outer face, no hair, small mouth, thin arms, hands like a duck with tannish brown webbing, three or four long fingers with nails on the end. After hypnosis, she felt like the reptilians need human beings to make them stronger. They're trying to get our genes. 
threat of dying out, inbreeding with us to see if the genes we have can make them the reptilian stronger, close quote. Like so many other experiencers of the non-human abduction syndrome, the Missouri abductee did not understand what the survival problem is or why Earth life should be involved in an alien species regeneration, especially reptilian. Springfield, Missouri, July 1983. Lizard guy on the left is seen through the binoculars by Ron and Paula Watson of Mount Vernon, Missouri. This is in a pasture where small gray beings floated a cow over the grass above ground into the waiting craft next to what they called the lizard guy. The craft also seemed to be guarded by a hairy Sasquatch type creature on the far right, possibly working with the lizard types as a physical labor force made specifically to do work on Earth are eight-foot-tall, long-haired, ape-like creatures commonly known as Bigfoot or Sasquatch. In the 1983 Missouri cow abduction incident, the hairy creature had large, round eyes with yellow vertical pupils. Well, in a Montana rancher in the mid-1970s near Great Falls, Montana, he shot at an eight-foot-tall Sasquatch type that had long reddish brown hair all over its humanoid body, the rancher shot with a 30 6 rifle. And that creature disappeared in a flash of light. I read it in a document in the sheriff's offices with my own eyes. Other similar light flash cases have provoked speculation that we humans are being manipulated by an intelligence that has sophisticated technology that can make us see anything that it wants us humans to see. There are many eyewitness testimonies by abductees about encountering three-dimensional holographic projections that are indistinguishable from the matter world, except that the abductees have a gut sense of 3D holograms, not flesh or matter. All of this effort to understand what our government knows about non-humans interacting with our planet began when I was director of special projects at KMGH-TV, the CBS station then in Denver. Beginning in September 1979 and for the next nine months until its first broadcast on May 25, 1980, I was producing the television documentary A Strange Harvest about the worldwide animal mutilation mystery that had been publicly reported since at least the middle of the 20th century. A strange harvest led to my contract with Home Box Office in March 1983 to produce an hour special with the working title, ETs, The UFO Factor. One of the first meetings I had at the beginning of research and script development for the HBO documentary was at Kerland Air Force Base in the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, also known as AFOSI. The date was April 9, 1983. New York attorney Peter Gersten, who worked with Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, had organized my meeting with AFOSI Special Agent Richard Doty to obtain names and addresses about an alleged UFO incident at Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota in 1978. That's when an armed security guard had his gun aimed at a non-human outside a landed disk on or near that airbase. The being emitted a beam of light that evaporated the gun right out of the security guard's hand, according to military eyewitnesses. But instead of giving me names and phone numbers for Ellsworth Air Force Base eyewitnesses, as Attorney Gersten told me that Doty would, the AFOSI agent handed me a document from a desk drawer that looks something like this simulation. Quote, briefing paper for the President of the United States of America on the subject of unidentified aerial craft. Close quote. The paper also referenced unidentified aerial vehicles and in some places, unidentified aerial craft. The alleged presidential briefing paper was about government monitoring of an alien presence from at least World War II, and it included this sentence, quote, extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA 
in already evolving primates to create Homo sapien, close quote. According to current Earth science, those evolving standing up primates began with the Australopithecus lucy on the left about three million years ago that changed over time through various primate models to Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien, which is us modern humans on the right. We emerged about 35,000 to 40,000 years ago when Neanderthals went extinct. On the right is a Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien skull compared to Homo neanderthalensis on the left. In my long career, of investigations trying to learn the truth about other intelligences interacting with Earth, I have been told that at least the Eben civilization is a telepathic and very advanced cosmic population that is connected in a hive mind, the opposite of humans that are like islands from each other. If the Ebens are the most friendly to our human government, then why do they allow harvesting of sperm and egg genetic material from Earth in order to produce clone biological body containers? Or are the Ebens the harvesters themselves in this laboratory called Earth? Whichever alien type or types is creating cloned or hybrid life forms from human genes, what is the purpose? This is Linda Moulton Howe. Please stay tuned to my Truth Hunter series on Gaia for more surprises about our universe, this solar system, and the planet we live on.